Good afternoon, everybody, and a very warm welcome to our Marketing Club webinar series. We've got a great session for you today on a fundamental skill to have if you're a marketer, that's copywriting. The CIM's very own content marketing manager, Stuart Thomas. If you've watched any of our Marketing Club webinars before, then you'll know how this works. But for those joining us for the first time today, welcome. And before I pass things over to Stuart, I'll very quickly give you some info about the session and how you can get involved in the Q&A. So we'll be hearing from Stuart for around 45 minutes. We'll then move into a 10 to 15 minute Q&A to answer some of your questions. You can post your questions at any time during the session by clicking on the question mark you'll see on your screen. So don't be shy, pop in your questions and we'll look forward to hopefully answering some of those a little bit later on. Stuart's presentation deck is available to download whilst we're on air. All you'll need to do is pop into the handout section and you'll be able to download it from there. And remember, you'll be able to watch the session again, along with all our previous webinars on the CIM YouTube channel. Just head into playlists, find the Marketing Club folder, and you'll find them all there to watch whenever you want with sessions on personal branding, digital trends, marketing strategy, and CSR, among others. Now, if you would like to share any thoughts about today's webinar, or indeed any of our webinars or events on the socials, you can use the hashtag CIM events. We'd love to see your comments on the socials, so please do get involved and do let us know what you think of today's session. So before I hand over to Stuart, I'll quickly explain what the Marketing Club is. It was created primarily to help students get the most from their CIM accredited degree and prepare them for a career in marketing. The accredited degree program enables students to gain a professional marketing qualification by taking advantage of the exemptions the degree provides. Throughout the academic year, we run a series of webinars tailored to meet your needs sharing the latest thinking, trends and techniques in real-world marketing delivered by industry experts. We have a dedicated page on our website where you'll be able to watch previous Marketing Club webinars and access articles and insights from podcasts and our content hub. Although the Marketing Club is designed for students, CI members and other marketing practitioners are also welcome to attend the webinars. So if you're a university student, you can sign up now to receive the Marketing Club newsletter. All you need to do is take a photo of the QR code on screen. Alternatively, you can hop onto our website to find the Marketing Club webpage within the qualifications drop down menu. Each edition of the newsletter will provide you with content designed to support your studies and actively manage your professional development by keeping you up to date with the latest trends, innovations and concepts in the marketing industry. So it really is worth signing up. We'll pop the QR code up again a little later when we head into the Q&A if you want to find out further information or sign up. Okay, so that's enough from me. I'd now like to hand you over to our guest speaker, CRM's Content Marketing Manager, Stuart Thomas. If you want to turn on your webcam, Stuart, I'll pass things over to you, and the floor is yours when you're ready. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Phil, for that lovely introduction. Yes, welcome to the Copywriting Marketing Club webinar, The Basics of a Marketing Cornerstone. So, as we go into it, I thought I'd start by explaining why I'm the one speaking to you right now. So, Stuart Thomas, Content Marketing Manager for CIM, and my copywriting path, which is about uh, sort of 11 years and counting so far, is starting with English at university, Coventry University, I recommend it, um, on to uh, comms assistant at uh, England Hockey Board, where I was doing things like match reports and uh, emails and talking about the fixtures that were coming up and the things that had happened in the uh, hockey world over the previous week. Uh, after that, then moved on to be a uh, copywriter, both for uh, products and uh, blog posts, emails at a couple of Virgin companies where I then also became a marketing executive on the B2B side. Um, so some experience in B2B uh, blogs and emails again, some social work as well. Um, onto e-commerce copywriting again for uh, online gardening center Primrose, um, which involved um, blog writing, uh, all of the emails, uh, which are sent by someone else, but written by me. Um, and also a little bit of web development as well, because it's surprising that uh, copywriting does actually have some involvement in uh, web development, uh, until I got to where I am now, which is a content marketing manager, where I now um, 
pass on a lot of the uh, copywriting skills and tips uh, onto my team uh, for the sort of fabulous uh, blog posts that they produce as well. So getting into it, what are we going to cover today? We're going to start with the importance of copywriting and, uh, you know, why, why words matter, which then flows nicely into the weight of words and uh, how, you, you know, sometimes you've got to be careful about what you say. Um, speaking for a brand, talking about uh, tone of voice or TOV. Uh, the copywriting process, which sometimes isn't as straightforward as you might like it to be. Uh, consider the audience. So remember who you're writing for, not just the customer, um, but also uh, your line manager, your director, everybody that the, uh, the brand represents. Tools to up your game. So things that can help you just become that slightly little bit better copywriter or indeed just a basic copywriter. So things that I have used myself or also that I've uh, heard being used or, you know, tested a little bit. Brevity is the soul of wit, which is all about keeping it short. And uh, it's a well-known phrase, so uh, remember it well. Uh, the point of punctuation. Um, so talking a little bit about what various pieces of punctuation are for and chiefly try and avoid semicolons. Write for your friends. So less about using slang, but more about getting to the point and uh, using contractions. Uh, credits for novelists. So you're not going to become a sort of Don Draper with your name in lights and everyone knowing who you are. Um, sometimes when you're doing copywriting, it's more about uh, just, just the words, not who you are uh, and don't take it to heart. And then last but not least, of course, have fun with it because um, language is a, is a thing to be played with uh, even when you're writing for business. So take it seriously, but not always too seriously. Onward. So the importance of copywriting, it's where most marketing starts. So whether you're right, planning to become a social media executive or whether you are planning to get into content writing or you might be planning to do PPC advertising, just those little snippets that go on Google. Um, it's all copywriting, ultimately, even if uh, the people that do those things wouldn't necessarily write copywriting on their CV. Um, because it's all about communication and you can barely communicate uh, without using words unless you're sort of working for Intel inside and you can just use that little bit of noise uh, to tell people that uh, it's an Intel uh, piece of content that you're doing. Um, as you can see in the sort of like the top left there, it's not just for uh, business writing as well. Uh, you can also use it on your CV. Um, so get better at copywriting and you can write yourself a better little uh, intro at the top of your CV explaining who you are and what you do. Um, and you can also use it to write better cover letters and uh, you know those little bits that you send off to the company to say ah oh, please consider me for hiring me for this role um, you know using your your keywords and uh, everything that makes good copywriting can also uh, get your foot in the door um, but of course it's not always roses um, sometimes uh, you'll draw the ire of uh, you know the advertising standards authority complaints and um, Sometimes you'll have uh, just regular people complaining. Uh, so you've got a Crown Paints example at the bottom there and also an example from Duolingo where they were uh, referring to something that was happening in the news that perhaps Duolingo shouldn't have been referring to. Um, whether it negatively impacted the brand as a whole, as, as a whole, uh, unlikely, um, but they would have drawn, you know, sort of like a little bit of uh, ire and flack at the time. Um, so, you know, uh, think about the words that you're using which leads into the weight of words. Uh, so gone are the days of unverified hyperbole because ads are now pulled if you lie uh, or uh, sort of do a little bit of mistruthing. Uh, example there from, uh, I think it's the 1950s, at 60 miles an hour, the loudest noise in this new Rolls-Royce comes, Rolls Royce comes from the electric clock, which is patent lies. Um, they might have been able to argue at the time and uh, I mean, they probably didn't have to argue to anyone because it was the uh, halcyon days of the 50s. But um, by putting in speech marks, they might claim that it was a customer quote uh, and thus they're not uh, sort of beholden to keeping it to the truth. But then just underneath, you'll see says an eminent Rolls Royce engineer. So packed full of bias and the sort of thing that wouldn't fly today. Um, an example from today or a couple of years ago. Um, Shell had to take down an ad which featured the slogan, make the difference, drive carbon neutral, because it's very much putting on the customer, sort of, uh, you can stop climate change, when of course Shell are pumping out all of the gases and stuff that are leading towards climate change, so naturally it got pulled. 
Uh, typos can impact sales. Um, whilst more often than not, if you were to see a typo on a uh, particular product that you wanted to buy, it probably wouldn't stop you. It might lead you to sending out a pithy tweet saying, ha ha, look at what this company did, but you might buy it anyway. Um, but when it comes to uh, Google and e-commerce, typos can be impactful because uh, in the example here, uh, a website called tightsplease.co.uk had misspelled the word tights uh, on their page, which obviously Google is then not surfacing it as a result when people are searching for tights. They corrected it, and lo and behold, sales shot up. Um, there's also the million dollar Oxford comma, um, which if you download these slides, you'll be able to uh, follow the link and read all about it. That's in a piece of, uh, it was contract. It was a contract that was, uh, they'd not separated two things between uh, packing and delivering. Um, so people were able to claim overtime because they were just delivering, not delivering and packing. Uh, so as you can see, it cost them $5 million. Um, the likelihood of you uh, causing a million dollar Oxford comma problem is slim. Um, but you know, at some point over the course of your career, you may well have to read over a contract. Um, so it's good to be able to uh, think how language can be interpreted. Uh, and in the modern day and age, it is keywords which are king. Um, the example at the bottom there is if you search the buyer's journey, as you can see in those results, the buyer's journey is in bold uh, because that is the thing that people have searched for. Google understands that and it's Google that's uh, bolded those words. They might be bold on the, uh, the blog post themselves, um, but whether they are or not, Google will do it. And it just means that you've got to make sure if you're writing about a particular topic or something of interest that you want people to be able to find, make sure to use the keyword and use it high up as well. Uh, all of those examples will be uh, somewhere near the top of the page, I'd wager. Um, so yes, remember the weight of words. Speaking for a brand, um, something that's part of copywriting is that you're kind of being a face of the company or in a faceless way, uh, that your words are what uh, people are seeing and you've got to be careful with the way that you write them. Um, you've got to, usually you'll be given guidelines uh, when working for a company as to what that tone of voice is. And it'll give you a couple of examples of, um, you know, whether you've got to use particular words or maybe do or don't use exclamation marks, things like that. Um, because you're kind of embodying the brand uh, when you're copywriting. Uh, so there's an example there uh, from Innocent in the top left-hand corner. Uh, I think it's on the back of a bottle. Life's pretty strange. Here we are in an unfathomably infinite universe. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot of waffle, um, but it's how Innocent like to do it. And it's playful waffle at that. Um, so you can identify the fact that it is Innocent. Um, and, you know, you can look at that bit at the bottom where it's about that singing otter. Last year we made a TV advert with a singing otter, less silly than it sounds. Um, and even though there's not a logo on there, you might be able to guess as to who it is. And that is Innocent again. Um, and that goes on to the, uh, I've put sound without sigils, that should probably be signs. Um, and you know, that's all part of copywriting is uh, thinking about it afterwards and how the words could be different. Um, but you won't always be able to rely on the logo being next to the words that you're writing in order to identify that it's uh, your company that you're writing for or about or from. Uh, so an example there is, does exactly what it says on the tin. Um, some of you will know that brand, some of you won't, um, but it is Ron Seal and it was their famous slogan that they used for a long time. And if you wrote, does exactly what it says on the tin, everyone would think of Ron Seal, regardless of whether the logo is in there. You won't always be able to get to that uh, level of salience. Um, and you know, you might not even necessarily be able to write, I mean, that tagline was almost certainly come up with by a team, um, but you can um, use tone of voice in order to make people think of a brand uh, without using the logo. And remember that you're representing the brand when you're speaking. The copywriting process. Um, everywhere I've worked that's involved copywriting has followed this broad process, which is draft, review, edit, review, publish, review. Because even after it's published and it's out there, if it's a blog post in particular, uh, you can always review it, tweak it and improve it. 
if it's something like a press release, um, you're not going to be able to uh, review it or fix it after it's out in the world. Um, so depending on how out of your hands it becomes after you uh, publish it, um, depends on how much, how carefully you have to read over it before it goes out. Um, because usually with blog posts, um, it'll do a little circle like this. So it's review, then it's back to edit, then it's review again, then it might be edit again. Um, but be careful that you don't go through too many edit review steps. Um, more for your own sanity and not annoying your line manager. Um, because if they have to review it over and over again, they'll think that you're not uh, listening or thinking uh, more broadly about the suggestions that they're making. So if they've suggested that you should um, use a contraction, you know, change that is to that, um, look through the rest of the copy to see other places that you might be able to use contractions and also think, why are they telling me to use a contraction? Is it to make it more friendly, more uh, readable, uh, those kinds of things. Um, so yeah, just uh, al always be reviewing. Um, you don't want to be in an endless cycle though um, of going through your line manager. After it's published, uh, do the reviews yourself. Don't necessarily send it to other people uh, unless the edit that you're then going to make after the fact is a uh, fundamental change to it. And along with sending it over to um, into review stage is the phrase, kill your darlings. Uh, that comes up a lot with uh, novel writing usually, uh, or maybe your own personal blogs, but it's the fact that um, sometimes those amazing puns that you've written or uh, awesome pieces of alliteration um, aren't actually selling the product or convincing the customer to do a particular action. Um, so just, just bin them. Um, if you think they're particularly amazing, uh, feel free to make a kind of a written note of them uh, in order to tell your friends about afterwards or your significant other because you're so proud of the thing that you've written. Um, but if you're writing it purely for the fact that it made you smile, um, take it out uh, because it's the customer that you want to make smile. Uh, and also probably your line manager is going to make you get rid of it anyway. So uh, don't try and hold on to it for the sake of it. So that is the copywriting process broadly. Consider the audience. So like that last point where the fact that you're writing for the customer, you're also writing for everyone. So you're writing for your line manager, potentially your uh, area director, um, anybody that's going to read it before it goes out there, as well as all the people that are going to read it once it's out there. Um, so you've got to think about who's signing it off. Um, if you write something that you think is definitely 100% going to resonate with the customer, but your line manager takes issue with it, be prepared to fight for it a little bit and say, look, the, the customer feels this way. These words follow with that way. Um, but every now and then, um, you will have to just get rid of it, um, but don't take it personally. Um, but just know that um, you don't automatically have to get rid of it just because your line manager suggested it. But if they're really forceful about it, then you do. Um, so yeah, the, the customer is king. And the other part of that is that you are not the customer. So even if you buy the product of the company that you're working for or uh, pitching for, anything like that, um, you have bias that you're bringing to the table. You might know more about the product than is actually uh, communicated to the customer, or you might get a staff discount, something along those lines. So you shouldn't be writing thinking, this would make me buy it. You want to be writing in the sense that it would make them buy it. Um, but even after you've followed all of that, um, sometimes uh, the wider world will uh, complain about it. You might have, uh, I don't know, uh, used a word that's a little bit wrong or in this particular example, so bringing up crown paints again, is that uh, it triggered complaints of misogyny and sexism. Uh, you may remember the ad. It was a crown paints ad where a nursery had been painted a lovely mustard yellow and a uh, chorus of singers were t uh, singing about why they'd painted it that particular yellow and it's how they decided to have a baby but it was decided to have a baby after having previously chosen not to have children, or at least from the uh, mother's perspective. And from the father's perspective, it was, they hope that it's his. Uh, which obviously 
caused a great deal of complaints because it's uh, kind of talking about people being unfaithful or people suddenly deciding to go from childless to having children when you know that might be a life choice. Um, but it's also the flip side of the complaints was that that is how some people live. Um, so whilst there were a lot of complaints, uh, I don't think the uh, complaint was upheld by the Advertising Standards Authority because it wasn't uh, lies. Um, and you know, whilst it was uh, a little bit insulting to a certain group, it wasn't insulting to the uh, broad public. Um, and it almost certainly uh, resulted in a lift in sales for Crown Paints. So on one side it worked, on the other side it didn't. So there are two sides to it. but. Always think about who's going to be reading it after the fact. Um, I don't think there's a copywriter out there that hasn't at some point had to uh, apologize or go back on the words that they've put out um, because it's unintentionally caused offense. But the main thing is to accept those mistakes, uh, apologize for them. Um, sometimes you might be tempted to feel like, oh no, I've been backed into a corner. I've got to justify all of these words and decisions I made. But the main thing is that on the front face of it, um, that you are apologizing and that you just change it because you know uh, your words are not so valuable that they are immutable and can't be changed. Right, the nice easy bit and possibly what brought a lot of you here is the tools to up your game. So the things that you can use to make your um, copywriting just that little bit smoother. Uh, the one that I use the most, um, probably every single day I use this one, is the Grammarly plugin for Chrome. Um, it's a simple little extension that you can get from the uh, Chrome extension store, um, but it's free. Um, there is a premium option, uh, which you can use to uh, look at entire sentences as opposed to just single words, but I just use it as a bit of a spell checker um, because if you're writing directly into your um, content management system or CMS, um, you're going to need some sort of spell checker um, because I don't think anyone writes everything perfectly the first time it comes out, uh, even me. Um, so you need something that just kind of checks over your work without you doing it. Um, I don't think it's got an autocorrect, so don't rely too much on that. You know, uh, lowercase i is automatically become capital I when you're talking about yourself, um, things like that. Um, but it will underline it in a nice red so that after you're finished you check back through and see all of those places that the red is underlined. Um, another one that I know uh, some of my colleagues have used in the past is Hemingway. Um, I don't think it's an app, it's just a website that you go to, copy your content into it and as you can see there it then highlights it in various useful colors. Um, shows you the slightly long sentences, shows you the two long sentences. Um, yeah, so that example there is almost three lines long. Don't do sentences that are three lines long. Um, and if you see something like that, just look for places that you can split it in half. Um, don't think too much about using punctuation to slow it down. Don't be using commas and semicolons. Just find a place to slap a full stop in there and use a full stop. Um, it's also marked in green passive phrase uh, or passive voice, which sometimes you will have to use um, passive voice is not automatically bad voice um, because there it's talking about phrases in green have been marked to show passive voice and of course they have you didn't mark them the active voice there would be uh, mark phrases in green you haven't taken an action so you wouldn't use active voice to do it um, what else have we got there we've got the words helpfully and perhaps highlighted in blue um, helpfully is a word that should be there um, but the word perhaps you could probably get rid of. So again, it's just uh, highlighting how you might want to um, study your language. Uh, if you're writing for SEO, uh, SEO purposes, Yoast is a really useful resource um, for just uh, SEO content tips. If it's your entire job, uh, you probably want to do a little bit of uh, SEO CIM training uh, in order to, for a good, a uh, few hours in a day or a couple of days, um, just be immersed in everything SEO. And it also gives you a greater understanding of why you do those things. Um, because it's all well and good saying use a keyword in a heading, but you want to understand why you're supposed to use a keyword in a heading. 
Um, if you're writing in WordPress, there's a Yoast plugin, uh, and it gives you a nice, helpful uh, traffic light system as to how well your uh, post is likely to perform uh, from an SEO perspective. Um, but don't chase the green light. Um, just aim, aim for an amber at the very least. Uh, if it's coming up in red, you've probably got some problems. Um, but sometimes it'll highlight things like um, overuse of passive voice or you haven't used your keyword enough. And sometimes over a sort of 1500 word uh, blog post, you definitely won't have used the keyword enough. You never will. Um, it would just end up seeming repetitive. So don't worry too much about chasing that, uh, that green. And then last but not least, but at the very least, you have, there's no excuse in this day and age for letting a spelling mistake get through the cracks. And the best way to avoid those is drafting everything that you write in either Microsoft Word or Google Docs, because both of them have built-in spell checkers and grammar checkers. Um, so the screenshot of the editor that I've used there is from the uh, notes that I took for this uh, specific webinar, and that one spelling mistake is tights, and it just picks it up straight away. Same again for Google Docs. I just copied the whole thing in there, and it pulled out tights straight away. So in uh, Word, it is, uh, you go to the review panel and then select editor, it's uh, on the left hand side, big and blue, uh, whereas on Google Docs, it is in the tools uh, panel and then it's just uh, spelling and grammar, but super easy to use um, and they're particularly useful for picking up spelling mistakes. However, what they won't do is pick up spelling errors that are wrong in context. Um, so in something I wrote the other day, I'd used the word flowing when I meant following uh, when talking about influences and naturally it didn't pick it up. In actual fact, I think it auto-corrected to flowing after I'd written it as following. Um, so you will still have to use your eyes and brain, unfortunately. And with Hemingway, um, don't, and Grammarly in fact, don't take everything that they suggest when it comes to grammar as gospel. Uh, because sometimes your own or the company's tone of voice or the way that you write isn't considered perfect by they st their standards. But if you are convinced that it's still legible and understandable, ignore their suggestion. Uh, more often than not, they'll tell me to take out Oxford commas, which I absolutely love. And if they'd done that with that uh, contract, um, it would have caused them the issue from the very beginning. It wouldn't have spotted it. Um, so, don't do everything they tell you because otherwise also you'll just sound like Grammarly and Hemingway and you want to sound like you slash the brand. Uh, and if you download all of those slides, there are some uh, links to the various ones of those. And actually looking at my, my little notes there, I realized the little secret one that I use myself uh, and that's the Chrome dictionary extension. Um, so it won't help you as you're writing, but as you're reading someone else's content, uh, wherever you like to consume your content, uh, if there's a word that comes up that you don't know what it means or how it's supposed to be used, just double click it and up pops a little uh, dictionary definition and then slowly but surely you'll improve your own vocabulary as well. Bit of fun. Brevity is the soul of wit. Um, so this is use as few words as possible. Um, McDonald's, I'm loving it. Three words. Nike, just do it. Three words. Get straight to the point. Um, it doesn't just apply to taglines, uh, as you can see there. It also applies to CTAs. Read more, learn more, book now, download. You don't even have to say that it's now because buttons imply immediacy anyway. Uh, and buy now, which is the one that's uh, usually just fallen back to, uh, particularly in e-commerce, just buy now. Uh, the customer knows exactly what's going to happen when they click that button. Um, it also applies to uh, your blog content as well. Short sentences, short paragraphs. Um, don't necessarily go so far as me think why waste time say lot word when few word do trick. Um, you still want it to be uh, grammatically correct and have a nice little flow to it. Um, but take out waffle. Um, you know, you're not uh, writing an essay. You're not padding the word count. Um, if by the time that you're finished, the blog post that you've written is 500 words instead of 800, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe you have in fact said everything that you need to. Have a little double check to check that you have said everything. Um, but generally, 
keeping it short is uh, nice and simple. I mean, there's a B2B one there, which I think is talking about setting up websites. Uh, build your brand, three words. Sell more stuff, three words. Sign up free, three words. Um, and within those, I couldn't even necessarily tell you the brand that it is, um, but you know what they're going to do for you. Um, and yeah, I mean, we're trying to be brevity, so let's go straight on to the next one. The point of punctuation. Uh, this one has come up several times uh, over the course of my career, but just avoid semicolons. Uh, that search from the University of Sussex says the semicolon has only one major use. I'm not sure how true that is. I think I can think of two. Um, but if it's only got one use, how often are you really going to need it? Um, and that one use that it calls out is that it's separating two clauses which could be separate sentences to which you automatically think well why aren't they separate sentences and there is no good reason so just make them separate sentences uh, hyphens can replace commas uh, example there because sadly no marketer gets it um, if you've found that a sentence you've written has got I don't know uh, four commas maybe even just three or more, think about where you might be able to use a hyphen instead. Uh, you can use it uh, at the end of a sentence as well to sort of uh, separate your final point, like because it is, you can use a hyphen before that. Uh, it implies a pause um, and that is way that uh, pretty much everyone will read it. Um, so there again, too many clauses, full stop. So uh, separate your sentences out. Um, it lowers the um like readability uh reading level of what you're writing um it's less about um making it simplified or maybe it is more about making it simplified but not everybody that's reading what you've put out there has a really high reading level can read to the level of say an english graduate um and also they have short attention spans um not because they are simple but because they've uh time is money time is important um so just short simple sentences to uh keep people paying attention to what you've written and also you want to have nice uh white space which is the lots of line breaks it is essentially punctuation um but if you've got two sentences next to each other that are just that little bit further apart um in meaning or, or sense um you can put in a line break and just separate it into a new paragraph um and then that way when you're sort of zoomed out as we are on that blog post there um there's lots of white space and it's just pleasing to the eye and it also means that people can skim read more easily and uh get down to that uh, sweet CTA that you should have at the bottom of every single blog post. Uh, yeah, so if you remember anything from this webinar, avoid semicolons. Write for your friends. This is less about uh, using slang. Um, you can still use uh, colloquialisms, particularly if you're trying to sell to a uh, local market. Uh, so, you know, if there's a colloquialism from your uh, particular county, feel free to throw it in there. Um, but use contractions. Um, there's this uh, belief that if you're writing for a business, uh, you have to write in a sort of, that is the way it is done, when really you can say, that is the way it's done. Um, and it gets to the point a lot faster. Uh, as you can see from these uh, Google snippets, you want to get to the point as quickly as possible. Um, more often than not, answer it in the first paragraph. Um, if you were telling a story to your friends, um, you would say something along the lines of, oh, I fell out of a tree the other day, then go into some of the detail as to how you ended up doing that, and then you end it with, so I fell out of a tree. Um, if you were to start it with, something funny happened to me the other day, then go through all this description, and then end with, I fell out of a tree, people are going to be bored of what you were saying and um, that goes just as well for uh, blog posts. It might lead to a high bounce rate um, but uh, if the website that you're writing for has a particularly good retargeting strategy, if someone just clicks into a blog post for just a couple of seconds or to get the answer that they're looking for, they'll then be followed by retargeting ads. Um, so you don't have to worry too much about the fact that they're not necessarily clicking a CTA. Um, and also it leads to more brand recognition. Um, 
that if someone's clicked in and read a blog post that you did, they might come back to you for other blog content in the future, uh, or they will just think of your brand uh, the next time they're looking for that particular product. Um, so what we've got here for our examples, how to tell the difference between Lamborghinis, the side air intakes are the big giveaway, and then goes into uh, what those differences are. Uh, I did write this. Uh, and the other one there um, is, in short, the five stages of your customer's buying journey are, and then it says all five of them. Uh, it only goes into the detail of the first one, but then that might draw people into to read the rest. Although, as you can tell from the uh, ellipses there, the rest of the information is contained within. Um, so you just click on it and then you find out everything. And then it also pulls through that nice image. Um, so yeah, don't bury the lead. That's a uh, principle from journalism, uh, where if you've got like a, a headline, you want to explain what the headline is quite quickly. And lastly, that B2B doesn't equal boring. Um, there's also this idea that if you're writing for a business that's for a business, let's say uh, software as a service, um, that you have to write in a really stuffy uh dull way um, but the important thing to remember is that you are a person and you're writing to another person you know someone within that decision making unit uh, the other business um, that wants to be engaged with uh, they don't want to read a really stuffy thing um, you know maybe if you're working for a legal firm uh, that might be approached a little bit differently but still you want the uh, the main side of it to be the front side of it to be super approachable particularly high up the funnel uh, a little bit further down when you're getting into the the real nitty gritty as to why someone should uh, buy your product or, you know, it's a, a salesperson with that direct relationship, you can start to get like a little bit more boring and go really deep into the details. Um, but at the, the higher up level that most copywriting is, uh, you can be fun with it. That example at the bottom there, I think is from uh, Slack. Hooray, your campaign is officially live and people are responding. Delight customers with your carefully crafted, well-timed responses. Um, and you know, that's Slack. It's selling a communication tool to other businesses, but you know, they've used an exclamation mark. They don't necessarily have to be just the copywriter's crutch that can be used well uh, in other circumstances. Um, so yeah, write as though you want other people to read it. You know, write for your friends, not for your professor. Um, don't pad the uh, the word count uh don't hide what you're trying to just get to the point credits for novelists uh this is something that's actually come up uh recently but it's the fact that when you're doing copywriting you won't always get your name on it and that's okay um the main point is that you uh sold a product or got someone to sign up to a webinar um, or anything along those lines. Um, it's not about getting your, it's not making a name for yourself. Um, it takes usually a long time uh, for your name to kind of get out there as any kind of expert. Um, and uh, just just don't take it to heart when your name doesn't go on it. Uh, one of the examples that I've pulled out there is uh, from my own career, Aversion Incentives. Um, the sort of greatest social response that I ever got from anything I have ever put out. And my name's nowhere to be seen. Um, and it started with uh, sending a message out as Virgin Incentive saying, ah, congratulations, uh, you've won a prize. Please let us know when it comes through. That was also followed with um, some messages sent as uh, my line manager, sort of like uh, setting up a little uh, kind of relationship there, a little bit of ghostwriting. Uh, and then the person responded by taking a picture and tagging Richard Branson and, you know, loads of uh, social responses. The uh, followers of Virgin Incentives went up, I think, sort of tenfold. And the only reason you'd know it was me is because that's my handwriting on that little handwritten note. Aside from that, you'd never know it was me. Um, and that's just the way it goes. Uh, so, you know, when you're writing as a uh, on the social media for a particular company, it's unlikely you're going to be signing it off with your own name. Uh, you'll get that a little bit in customer service when there are different agents. Uh, they'll sign it off with their name, but usually it's just their first name. So it's not, uh, you know, they're not getting any huge amount of credit for it. And with that comes a note on portfolios. Uh, so both for students and the uh, sort of career marketers alike, uh, if you've written a particularly good piece or uh, done something that worked particularly well for your company, um, take some screenshots or print it as a PDF and save it somewhere that 
isn't on your work computer, email it to yourself um, and that way you keep a record of it because after you've left, uh, the company isn't beholden to keeping your author credit or even like keeping those posts. Virgin Incentive could have deleted those posts or like in that 404 example there, it's not for my own career, but you might see uh, a 404 when you go looking for that. Ah, oh, what was that great blog post I wrote three years ago? Uh, and it's just been deleted because the company feels it doesn't serve a purpose or it's taking up server space any number of reasons that you can't possibly fathom or guess, they might delete your work. So if you think it's great at the time, keep it, keep a copy of it. Uh, and then that goes on to ghostwriting, which is the more fun part, I would say, of uh, credit being removed. In the, because your name's not on it, maybe someone else's name is on it, you get to embody that person. You get to imagine how that person would write. Um, it's a, you know, it can be a lot of responsibility, but it's also fun and it's a, a nice little thing to put on the CV, ghostwriting experience. Um, it makes it very, it's uh, difficult to prove uh, after you've done a little bit of ghostwriting, um, but it is a, a, a fun part of writing where you can just embody someone else for a, a brief spell. But yeah, you're, you're not always gonna get credit. And then lastly, have fun with it. Uh, a lot of grammar rules can be broken uh, for almost every rule in English, uh, the English language, there's an example of it being broken. Uh, I'm not gonna embarrass myself by trying to come up with any of those examples now. Um, but that little screenshot there, which I've taken from uh, someone else's blog post, Stand on the Shoulders of Giants. Uh, I believe I put the credit in the uh, notes of the slideshow. But anyway, so what examples have we got here? Avoid alliteration, always. I love a bit of alliteration. If you can think of a good way of doing it, put it in. Um, prepositions are not words to end sentences with. Um, yeah, you can play around with that. And there's something about uh, splitting infinitives. Supposedly you're not supposed to do that, but if we didn't have that, you wouldn't get the uh, fabulous Star Trek to boldly go where no one has ever gone before. Like it's, it's a weighty phrase and it's achieved by splitting an infinitive, which you're not meant to do. Uh, avoid cliches like the plague, their old hat. Cliches are all over the place. Uh, feel free to use them, but don't use too many. Uh, issue ampersands and abbreviations. Uh, not sure about the use of the word issue there. You could have just always so said uh, avoid, but I guess they wanted to uh, not copy avoid from the previous one. But you can use ampersands. Uh, it's just a short and, but don't use it. Well, you can actually use it to uh, to cheat a word count, um, a character count rather. Um, if you use an ampersand, you've saved yourself two characters, boom. Um, one should never generalize, you can do that. Um, cliches, again, uh, be more or less specific. Um, not entirely sure what that one's all about, um, but you can um, play around with um, sort of getting straight to it. Um, sentence fragments eliminate. Um, I used an example of that just the other day in the uh, Smart Objective blog post, which you can find over on the CIM Content Hub. Uh, one of the sentences is literally just the word smart um, because it follows on where it explains what the S M A R T stands for. Smart. Um, exaggeration is a billion times worse than understatement. Um, you can use hyperbole. Um, you can use it more in blog posts, I would say, than uh, like printed ads. Uh, you don't want to get pulled up by the ASA. Although broadly, they will understand the difference between uh, hyperbole and a lie. Uh, parenthetical remarks, however relevant, are unnecessary. Um, I use brackets, parentheses, all of the time. Um, so I wouldn't worry about that one. You might want to worry about overuse. Um, if you're constantly using little sort of side notes and things like that, um, maybe think if they could be just a separate sentence afterwards or how they might be uh, expanded so as to not be in brackets. Um, but you know, feel free to use them. Uh, and who needs rhetorical questions? Uh, you'll use questions in blog post titles all of the time. Uh, so don't worry too much about rhetorical questions because you'll then answer it anyway. Um, and it doesn't always have to be straightforward. Um, so this example here from a Slack bug fix, um, often you'll see on bug fix things like uh, fixed text bleeding out of a window um, or a fixed button not visible when using uh, iOS 15, those kinds of things. And then the example here you've got is fixed 
When viewing a conversation on iPad, people noticed that there was sometimes a back button that would be visible, but which did nothing when tapped upon. This was meant as a reminder of the linear nature of time and that no matter how much we may yearn for certain elements of the past, we must press on ever forward, undeterred, unyielding. Can you imagine if that were true? It was absolutely a bug, our bad. It's a lot more worse than it needs to be, but it's just a little bit of entertainment and Slack is great at that. Think about the uh, micro copy and how you can do fun things with it. So here are the rules. Um, words matter. Uh, think about the words that you're using and uh, don't draw the ire of either your audience or the Advertising Standards Authority. Internalize the TOV, embody that tone of voice and the brand that you are writing for. Think if the brand were a person, how would they speak? Always be reviewing, very simple. Write for the customer, the customer is king, uh, but also write for your line manager and everyone else that's reading it, but the customer matters most. Grammarly is not a genius, but you can use it to fix those spelling mistakes. Keep it clear, uh, short sentences that describe exactly what the point is. Be hyphen happy, hyphens are probably my favorite piece of punctuation, so use them all the time. Get to the point, don't bury the lead. Uh, copywriting is not equal to authoring, um, so don't always expect to get your name on it. And then of course, have fun with it. An example there from a little uh, juggling man there. So that brings us to the end of that copywriting webinar, and now I think it's time for a Q&A. So I'll pass it back over to Phil. It is indeed, uh, Stuart, thank you very much. That was uh, really great and some fantastic uh, tips throughout the entire presentation. Um, as Stuart said, we're now going to move into the Q&A. Um, we've already received some great questions to get us underway, but please do continue to post your questions and we'll try and get through as many as we can in the next 10 minutes or so. Just a little reminder that if you want to comment on the socials about today's webinar, then you can use the hashtag CM events, which we've popped up on screen again, along with the QR code to find out further information about the marketing club. Okay, let's head off to our first question. We've got loads here, Stuart. I'm just going to sort of go through them in chronological order, I think. Um, okay. Top tip for avoiding writer's block. The sort of thing that I use to get over writer's block is to just start scribbling things out on a notepad. Um, say that it's a, uh, a topic that you've got to write a blog post about. Write the keyword of the topic and then just write things that are associated with that word. Um, and just that simple process of getting words on a page uh, can help you get past it. Sometimes it's simply a case of writing is writing that first sentence. I mean, admittedly, that might even be the point of writer's blog is that you can't write that first sentence. So think about the tenth sentence. Just go a bit further down from those words that you've taken off those topic. Which one of those things can you write about? And start with that, and then you might be able to skip back to you know what the the, the main topic is about. Um, and yeah, it's, it's all about just getting things on a page that aren't necessarily the blog itself. Um, just getting uh, in the practice of just getting words out of your brain. Okay, great. Thanks, Stuart. Um, here's one uh, which you're gonna love, hyphens or dashes. That can be a big issue. Yeah. Um, so within Microsoft Word, if you're using hyphen to kind of separate two points, once you start typing and then hit space, it becomes a, I think it's called an M dash. Um, really, those are the ones that you should be using. Um, but when you're writing directly into a CMS, it's not going to do that automatic change. Um, most people aren't going to notice those couple of pixels difference between a hyphen and a dash. Um, so you don't have to worry so much about um, how it looks once you've written it in. Um, I, I consider the two synonymous, um, but I will sometimes, if I notice that it hasn't done that automatic lengthening within Microsoft Word, I will copy it from somewhere else and put it in. Um, but if it ends up being left as a hyphen, um, that short version, uh, don't worry too much about it, unless you're doing something where you're writing in Excel and then turning it into page code. Sometimes the dash can be shown a little bit different, but as long as you know to look out for it, uh, it's easy to fix after the fact. Thanks. Thank you. Um, should any potential insult or controversy be avoided or is some provocation acceptable? 
is some provocation acceptable? It depends on the brand that you're writing for. Um, so take uh, BrewDog, for example. They have a very strong uh, brand tone of voice and it is or can be sometimes a little bit insulting um, or um, like provoking. Like uh, we're, I, th I think, did they use a swear? I don't think they used a swear word, but I think they did use like F asterisk hashtag K, which everyone knows what that really means. Um, so if it fits for your brand, yes but be absolutely sure that it fits your brand. Um, if you do it for a brand or indeed an audience that isn't receptive to it, the negative effects massively outweigh the positive ones. Um, so be very, very careful with provocation. Okay, um, this one's a hot topic. What are your thoughts on copywriters being replaced by chat DB, GPT? Do you mm. think copywriters have a future? Uh, I'm not hugely worried about being replaced by ChatGPT, or at least not in its uh, current state. Um, it has a tendency to um, be mistaken, which is uh, surprising really, considering this computer program. But because the way AI works is what goes in is what comes out. Uh, so if it's trained on bad data or questionable or biased data, it will kick out bias. Uh, whereas, and it won't realize that it's doing it, uh, whereas a person can usually uh, think on their bias and think how they can uh, avoid it. Um, and also something that's happened recently is between uh, chat GPT and I think it might be um, Bing's AI, the two of them now refer to each other because their results are being put on the web. Uh, and so they're ending up in this sort of uh, cycle spiral of uh, just making up references because the other one said it. Um, whereas again, a uh, copywriter can avoid that. And so far, uh, I think I've been broadly able to identify when something is written by chat GPT because it has a certain style. Um, and you can tell when it doesn't match the uh, sort of copywriter's previous output. So I think there is still a future for copywriters at the very least, uh, if it ends up being that copywriters don't write huge blog pieces anymore, they will still be checking them over for facts and inserting references and making sure that it follows a particular tone. Uh, so yes, I think there's still a future for copywriters and I'm not worried yet. Yeah, that's a relief, okay. Um, emojis in copy for social media, yes or no? I mean, let's just, Yes, um, but again, it does depend on the brand. <laughs> um, they shouldn't always be used to uh, replace words because not everyone's kind of uh, emoji dictionary is as advanced as uh, you know your average social media executive. Um, but you can absolutely use it to kind of like uh, emphasize a point or uh, give across emotion. Sometimes that can be a little bit difficult with uh, just words, um, but. I, I I feel like they're slightly replacing the uh, exclamation mark as the new copywriter's crutch. Um, so they should be used um, with thought and with care, not just slam dash wherever. Um, so there's a couple of questions around um, entry level jobs really. Um, first one is, is copywriting the right start for an entry level digital, digital marketing job? And similar question, what's the best way to get your job in copywriting or digital marketing without a degree or experience? Mm -hmm. um, so, <laughs> you know, my bias would be uh, that copywriting and studying English is a good uh, start to your kind of like marketing career, um, but it's by no means a uh, requirement. Just having a good understanding of English language uh, is useful. Um, so you can start as like a, a copywriter, um, or you can be like a, a proofreader if you're good at reading over other people's stuff uh, that can take you surprisingly far. Um, social media, I, I haven't gone for any social media roles myself um, and I think most people probably have a good sort of like social media ability uh, and provided you're good on your sort of like LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever, it's easy to prove. Um, but yeah, entry level, you know, uh, copywriting roles do exist. Um, if you don't see um, like copywriter as the uh, specific role at a company, you may well just see uh, 
marketing executive or marketing coordinator, and then you'll see sort of like copywriting first and foremost. Um, things to study, uh, yeah, English, uh, any language, I think will probably give you a good um, basis. So, you know, if you've studied French or German, uh, they give you a good understanding of kind of like grammar and how things flow. Um, and uh, yeah, probably any marketing degree really will give you a, a good fundamental understanding of uh, any copywriting role. Okay, thanks, Stuart. Um, I think we may have lost you part way through that, but I think we've got the general gist of the, the answer. Uh, sorry. Uh, uh, no, I just think it's just a, a glitch in the connection. Um, okay, do you have any tips for reviewing copy, balancing changing wording to how you'd write it with not rewriting someone's work? Hmm. I think the uh, a good way of sort of not rewriting someone's work is to have a draft sent to you in uh, Microsoft Word or Google Docs um, at reviewing level, not editing level. So people can make suggestions, but then you, um, the person submitting the copy, um, can go through and either accept or reject the things that people have said. Um, sometimes it will be uh, a super obvious thing, like a spelling mistake, it's pretty straightforward. Sometimes it'll be that you're reading it and it just, it doesn't feel quite right um, because the person that wrote it has a clear understanding of what it is they're trying to get across. But if you're not completely convinced as to what you've read either makes sense or gets the point across or um, says what the person was trying to say, uh, you can just kind of put a little comment on it saying, uh, what's the point you're trying to make here? Um, and also you can do things as comments rather than direct uh, suggestions of edits. So you can say things like, you might want to rethink about uh, shortening this sentence or could you add a line break here? Um, and if you put them in as um, comment suggestions rather than direct edits, um, the, the writer is more likely to think about what it is they've written rather than just like, yeah, fine, I'll accept all of these changes and move on. Thank you. Um, where can I find the best cases and learning resources stroke insights on copywriting? Well, on the CIM Content Hub, you'll find a great deal of articles about copywriting. Uh, if you just go on there and search copywriting, you'll find every uh, article that has copywriting, uh, I think, in the title, uh, but it might go into the, uh, the copy itself. Um, what sort of resources have I used? Um, are the Earlier on in my slides, I showed the book uh, Eat, Shoots and Leaves by uh, Lynn Truss. Um, that was a good little resource for me that just kind of helped with, um, you know, how to use punctuation and sort of little grammar rules and stuff like that. Um, reading other companies' blogs um, will give you a sense of what good copywriting looks like, um, even if they aren't themselves copywriting tips. Um, so you just look at how they've written a particular thing. Um, some blogs are better than others. Um, I think where I learned a lot of the short sentences, short paragraphs, uh, frequent subheadings, uh, HubSpot, uh, they do a really good job of the way that they lay their blogs out. Brilliant, okay. Um, I think we've run out of time for questions now. Um, I think Stuart, you've already mentioned the CIM's content hub. There's loads and loads of articles and blogs and content on there around the whole subject of copywriting and the and the content hub is fully searchable. So um, as Stuart suggested, that's a very good place to actually start if you want to sort of hone up on the subject. Um, but anyway, thank, thank you again, Stuart. Some really great questions and some really great answers there. Um, unfortunately, uh, that's all the time we've got for our webinar today. Um, I'd just like to thank Stuart once again for delivering an absolutely fantastic presentation. And we do hope you've enjoyed the session and been able to gain some handy tips to take forward and apply to your next piece of content. Thank you, Stuart. We'll be back with our final Marketing Club webinar on Wednesday, the 26th of April with George Honeyball and some practical advice on how to unlock the power of LinkedIn to boost your online presence. You'll find further details listed on the events and Marketing Club pages on our website where you can also register for the session. So that just leaves me to say a final thank you to you for joining us today and we hope you've enjoyed the webinar. Take care everyone and we look forward to seeing you again soon.